Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the third of our six Sundays leading back up into our joining together again for in-person services here at Hudson Wesleyan Church. Uh, I continue to be on a sabbatical, but I'm glad that you have joined together, though in separate locations for worship this morning. We're going to begin uh, with some music in just a second, and then we are going to hear a message this morning from Pastor Christy Lipscomb, who is the pastor at City Life Church in Grand Rapids. It's a message that she shared with her congregation this last year and that she has graciously uh, allowed us to use while I'm on sabbatical uh, to speak uh, truth to us from the word uh, this morning. So I hope that you will open your hearts and minds uh, to what the Lord has laid on her heart and her ministry here in the last year. Just a reminder that we're not doing online Bible study uh, or book study, any of that, while I'm on a sabbatical. We are planning to pick up most of the things, hopefully, that we have been having as part of our normal routine uh, at the beginning of March. Again, just another reminder, if you need to get a hold of me, please don't feel bashful about doing that. You can always call me on my cell phone, text me, get a hold of me uh, through social media or email, and I will do my best to get back with you. Let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we will sing together before we hear from the word. Lord, we admit that in times when things are so different, um, it's easy for us to um, disengage and for us to kind of hunker down and just um, hold on for things to get back to what we would consider normal. But we're thankful that your word speaks truth and life into every situation and every moment and every period of our lives. So whatever we're going through today, whatever this last week has held, whatever the week to come may hold, we pray that today we will be calm before you that we allow the truth of your word, the power of your spirit, to speak to our hearts. And that above all, you will continue to receive honor and glory, not just from our worship, but from our daily lives. For we are yours, and we love you. In Christ's name, amen. There is a fountain 
sinless minds beneath the flood lose all the guilty stains lose all the guilty stains lose all the guilty stains and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all the guilty stains the dying thief rejoiced fountain in his day and there have I though vile as he washed all my sins away washed all my sins away washed all my sins away Dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the end, some church of God be saved to sin no more, be saved to sin no more. Church of God, be saved to sin no I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus made it all, all to him I Sin, I left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Oh, now indeed I find thy power and thine alone can change a leopard spots and melt. The heart of stone Cause Jesus made it all All to him I owe Sin I left a crimson stain He washed it white as snow And when before the I stand and am complete 
Jesus died my soul to save My lips shall still repeat That Jesus made it all All to Him I owe Sin how that's a crimson stain He washed it white as snow still white as snow Mr. Christy and I'm so glad that you are here with us worshiping on this Fall Fest Sunday. Thank you for joining us on this day and if you're here for the first time we especially want to say thank you to you. I when I married Adam over 20 years ago, I married a camper. My family did not camp. I did not camp growing up, but I married a camper and it was the only kind of vacation we could afford. So we are now a camping family. I, my, my biggest reluctance to camping is the dirt factor. I really prefer to be a little cleaner than what camping usually allows me to be. But I have adjusted and I have now worked up to being able to go about three days without a shower if I really have to. So I, I'm getting there and working really hard, but I, I really prefer to camp with some stuff. When I camp, I want my cot. And I don't want one of those little chintzy camping pillows. I want like a pillow pillow. And so, and last time I camped, I took my electric skillet and my electric kettle, and I took an extension cord and I plugged them in and I cooked. That's kind of how I like to camp. I, I like some stuff. It makes the journey easier. Now, Adam also will do backpacking, not with me, but with other people. And he, he says, it's easier when you have less stuff. It makes the journey easier. But I'm not sure I agree with that. But today we are looking at an account in the Bible about a man who lived about, who lived about 800 years before Christ. A man who was going on a journey, a spiritual journey. And today's scripture is about the stuff that he packed. We're going to be looking at the book of 2 Kings. And in the book of 2 Kings, most of the stories in that book are about people who live in the country of Israel. But this particular story today in chapter 5 is about someone who is not from the country of Israel. In fact, it is an enemy to Israel. The man is actually a military general for one of the enemies of Israel. He's a military general for the kingdom of Aram. And at this point in the story, the war between Israel and Aram was over, and there had been a peace treaty between the countries, and, and things were, had really pretty much settled down. There were just, su just some minor border skirmishes every now and then, but, but for the most part, things were at peace. And this is a story about a military general named Naaman. Naaman from Ar Aram, and the trip he would take to visit the prophet Elisha in Israel. If you have your Bibles, feel free to open them or pull it up on your phone for, from 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1. If you don't have them, that's fine. Just feel free to listen to these, these five verses of Scripture. 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him, the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands had gone from Aram, had gone out and had taken a captive, a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. Naaman is this decorated commander. He is a favorite. He is close to the king of Aram. The king of Aram loves him. Naaman is fighting all of this, these military battles for him, and he keeps winning. The king of Aram loves Naaman. 
Naaman is successful. He is intelligent. He is courageous. He is valiant in battle. He is a winner. He is favored by the Lord even. I find it so interesting that at the second part of verse 1, it says that the Lord had given him victory. Now, Naaman didn't worship the Lord God. He was from another country. He, he served pagan gods. But here the Lord had been giving Naaman victory all along. He is Naaman. He is a powerful man. He is in an important position. And he is leprous. He has leprosy. This successful, achieving winner has leprosy, an incurable skin, degree, an incurable skin disease, a death summons. You get leprosy, that's, that's the end. You can't be the number one successful military commander if you have leprosy. This powerful man, he, he's got status, he's got wealth, he's got influence, he's got all the right friends in the right places. He's got power. But he doesn't have enough power not to fix his leprosy. So Naaman decides to go on a journey. He decides to go on a, a spiritual journey seeking to connect with a God he doesn't know. A spiritual journey because he's tried everything else and he's desperate. Desperation will drive you to great lengths. Everything in Naaman's life is great except for this one thing. If only this one thing could be gone. Well, what is that one thing for you? What is that one thing in your life that drives you towards spiritual traveling? What is that one thing in your life that pushes you to seek help beyond your own strength? Maybe it's thinking, well, if, if I could just lose some weight, then I would be satisfied. If I could just get a grip on my mental health, then everything would be fine. If I could just get that job, if I could just get that promotion, if I could just deal better with that one relationship, this painful thing, if I could just have that one thing, then everything would be fine. And a question I have for you today is, what is your leprosy? What is that, that one thing you just can't seem to figure out. Nathan starts to pack up for a spiritual journey. So he goes to his boss, the king of Aram. And he shows up to the king of Aram. And he says, hey, king, I, I hear that there's this prophet. And the king's response to him is, by all means, go. Those, those are the exact words from, from the NIV. Verse 5, by all means, go, the king says. I bless you. I'll even write you a letter of recommendation. By all means go, the king of Aram replied, verse 5, I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The king says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you a letter of recommendation. And I'm going to give you 750 pounds of silver and 150 pounds of gold. And I'm going to give you clothes. And you go and you try to get this. So Naaman packs up. And it tells us a little later in the passage that Naaman's actually riding in a chariot. And it doesn't say he's just in one chariot. He's actually bringing his servants with him. He's bringing a whole entourage of people. So he's bringing multiple servants, multiple chariots, multiple partners of horses to pull the chariots. And he's getting this whole big group together. So Nathan starts to pack his bags. He takes all of the things that he has relied on in his life to get ahead. His achievements, his successes, his education and his knowledge, his, his connection with royalty. He's got the connections. He has success. He's got the experience. And Naaman takes all the things that he has going for him and packs up 
to go and to see the prophet. Naaman's got hustle. Naaman's a hard worker. He's got the letter of recommendation. He's got the street cred. He's got the servants. He's got the people. He's got the money. And he's going to work hard. He's going to do what he has always done. He is going to bootstrap it. When things got tough on the military field, on the battlefield, you know what he did? He bootstrapped it. He worked hard. He dug in. When things got hard, he worked harder. He gave it all he got. He used his skills. He used his resources. He used his abilities. And so he packs and he takes all the resources he will need to give it all he's got to go and get what he needs. Naaman knew that this is how stuff works in, in his world. Because when, when you needed something in, the, in his world, what you did was you went to the king and you gave gifts to the king. And then if the king liked you, the king would give you permission to speak to his spiritual prophets. And then you would give more gifts to the spiritual prophets. And then if the spiritual prophets liked you and were satisfied with your gifts, then they would decide if they were inclined to call on favor to the gods. And so Naaman's like, all right, I'm going to take all my stuff, take all my resources, and I'm going to give it all I've got. What do you use to help you through life? What do you rely on? What have you packed for your spiritual journey? Maybe, maybe you have a leprosy, that thing that you're desperate to change in your life. That one thing that holds you back. What resources are you trying to use to conquer it? They don't necessarily have to be bad things. It's not bad to seek more smarts, more education, more courage. You're, you're trying so hard and you're caring so much and, and you've, got, you've got resources, but so far they haven't worked. Naaman's problem is leprosy. That's his presenting problem. But I would suggest that there's another problem going on here too. I think his soul is sick. And he thinks that if he just works hard enough, he can work his way to freedom. He thinks that enough silver and enough gold and enough, enough resources is going to buy favor. And so he brings his resources and he has all these resources, but his resources are only going to become his baggage. And so it is with us. We've got a problem. We've got, a, we've got a leprosy. And we go on a spiritual journey. We pack our stuff. We pack all the things that have helped us so far, all the things that we've been, been trying to do, our credibility, our intelligence, our exhaustive knowledge of the subject. And we pack our resources, but often these resources become our baggage. And we'll use all our strength and all our resources to try to get fixed. Enter the little girl. Second Kings chapter 5, verse 2 tells us, Now bands from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. And at that point, that's when Naaman goes to see the king, and the king, and, and, and then that's, that's how he decides to go from there. We have this Hebrew child slave. She was captured in one of the border skirmishes between Israel and Aram. We can presume that her family is dead, or it is impossible for her to be reunited. She is nameless. No one is coming after nameless. No one is sending the Israelite army out to rescue nameless. She's just a casualty of war. These things happen. It's just what it is. She's just a girl. Nameless is insignificant, unimportant, young. And she shows us here some, 
some interesting lessons, some things that I think we can learn from the leadership of children. Nameless is quick to forgive. She doesn't hold bitterness. I find it remarkable that she wants to see Naaman be healed. She doesn't just think, oh, well, good, he's going to die. She could have wallowed in her trauma, but she has found a way forward somehow, as children so often do, in resilience. She is generous spirited. She does not hold grudges toward her master. She selflessly shares this information with the people she is in bondage to. That's amazing. And she believes. She could have become embittered in her faith. People go through what she goes through, and people could say, I'm turning my back on God. God wasn't there for me. God didn't save me. I'm turning my back on God. And, and so many, especially adults, we do this. We grow embittered toward God. But so often the heart of a child is quick to believe. And she's confident. God can heal you. God can heal you. I just wish my master would go see Naaman. He, he could heal you. You know what? If, if she tells this to her mistress and then her mistress tells Naaman and Naaman tells the king and then Naaman goes on this journey, if Naaman goes all the way over to Israel, meets with the prophet and doesn't get healed, guess whose head is on the chopping block? Hers. And fascinated by her boldness, her simple confidence in the power of God. I'm fascinated by the risk that she takes. I'm fascinated by her willingness to help her enemy. I'm fascinated that they believe her. Naaman, his wife, the king, are willing to believe this girl. Now, we don't usually follow the instructions of unimportant people. We don't usually follow instructions of unsmart, weak, nameless people. It usually takes a full-on crisis to make a person of power willing to listen to a powerless person. But they do listen. And this crisis has turned their ears toward the voice of the powerless. And this is often the way God's kingdom works. So often, it is the crisis that turns the ears of the powerful to the voice of the powerless. The way of God's kingdom is often speaking through the least and the last and the lowest in society. Jesus said, many who are first will be last. Many who are last will be first. God often uses the least, the last, the lowest, the nobodies, the invisible people, the nameless people, the people that do not attract attention to bring in his kingdom. Now, some of you are visiting City Life today, and it's your first time here. And so far, you're, all that you know about us is what you've seen in the last few minutes. In many ways, City Life is a humble church. We're not so flashy. We're not so cool. Adam and I are not cool pastors, and we couldn't be even if we wanted to be cool pastors. We just don't have the cool gene. It's not in us. Our setup, as I fall off the back of the stage, see, I'm showing you. Our setup is pretty simple. Our leadership is pretty down to earth. It doesn't really matter what you wear to church. It's possible for you to come without a shower. We've had people come here not fully sober, and as long as worship isn't disrupted, we're okay with that. Basically, we are a church of pretty ordinary, messy people. We're kind of a humble church that way. In many ways, though, City Life is a rich church, a privileged church, a church full of treasures of the kingdom. We are a church that gets to worship side by side, haves and have nots. Now you can put yourself in whatever one of those categories you want to. It doesn't really matter. We've got them all here. We get to worship side by side. Those with more resources have the privilege of rubbing shoulders with those with fewer resources. Those who have more have the privilege of being spiritually challenged by those living in homelessness, those dealing with addiction, those in poverty. 
sometimes we have people of abilities and means and, and some stability in life show up at City Life and want to help all those people who don't have anything only to discover that as they get to know people, they are the ones who are changed. It's a treasure of the kingdom. We get to journey at City Life with a lot of people who are open about mental health struggles. I love that we talk about this here. It is a privilege to see and to watch the lives of those who are open about mental health struggles. And I am continuously amazed at the faithfulness and at the courage of those who are living with very debilitating mental illnesses who every day say, Jesus, because I believe in you, I'm getting up today. That's amazing to me. It bolsters my faith. They, they don't think it's anything big, a big deal. There's like, life isn't awesome. I'm, I'm just kind of struggling along. But I look at that and I say, that is faithfulness to God. We are a church full of kingdom treasures. Here in the story of Naaman, we have a child who is a war slave. A treasure of the kingdom. We don't even know her name. And this child slave, who has literally no human power, who has lost everything, who has no blood relatives, who has only a future of servitude in front of her, she is the only person who is actually free. And this is the mystery of God's kingdom. This is often how the kingdom of God works. God's kingdom is upside down. And if you're listening to this thinking, this doesn't make any sense, you're absolutely right. It does not make sense in the way that we talk about kingdom in our world and in our society and our human ways of thinking. We don't think of up, up being upside down this way. But Jesus is constantly telling us that his kingdom is an upside down kingdom, that the last will be first and the first will be last. Jesus said in Matthew 19, I tell you the truth, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And later in 1 Corinthians, it says, it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. What we think is so smart in God's kingdom, it's something different. What we think is so strong in God's kingdom is something different. What we think is so weak in God's kingdom is something different. What we think is so nothing, God thinks in his kingdom is so something. Naaman's got a lot of stuff. He's got money, he's got means, he's got the connections, he's got a great resume. He's got bravery, he's got character. He's a good guy. But all he needs is the one thing that Nameless has. Nameless has the one thing required for faith. Nothing. In the words of Sally Lloyd-Jones, all Naaman needed was nothing. It was the one thing Naaman didn't have. Naaman's not asking for a handout. He's, he's coming with his hands full. We don't like it when people ask for handouts. We frown when people ask for handouts. But you know what Naaman needs? He needs a handout. We need to seek help like the poor and the powerless. We need to seek help like the the little war slave. We need to seek help like children do, bringing nothing. Last week I preached about power and the Holy Spirit, and I like that kind of a sermon. This week we're talking about how the message of the kingdom is cloaked in humility. How the message of Jesus is cloaked in power. 
in, in humility. It always has been cloaked in humility. The gospel has always been wearing a coat of humbleness. Jesus came as a humble baby, needing to be cared for and tended. Jesus came wrapped in humble rags, not in a linen cloth. Jesus came sleeping in a humble manger. Jesus grew up as the son of a humble working class father. Jesus came and was homeless for most of his ministry. The scripture says he had no place to lay his head. The prophet Isaiah says he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. This is the way the kingdom comes. It's not always beautiful. Not always flashy. Not always majestic. Doesn't always look desirable. The message of Jesus, the spiritual journey, the pursuit of God, is a journey cloaked in humility and it always has been. And this, in this season of history, is God's way. We're going to continue the story of Naaman and the prophet Elisha in the next few weeks. But today I want to pause here, here after verse 5, with Naaman getting his bags together, making the decision to go on a spiritual journey and packing his bags and bringing all of his resources and getting ready to take them and present them as his offering. And I want to invite you to journey with Jesus. Maybe for some of you, it's starting a journey with Jesus today. Or maybe you've been journeying with Jesus for a long time, like I have had. I've journeyed with Jesus for, for a lot of years, and I think all of us have picked up some baggage along the way. And you know, some of the stuff we've picked up is, are, are good things. They're, they're skills and knowledge and understanding. We've tried to, to get some more resources, and, and God gives us certain tools to be able to deal with things. But maybe somewhere along the way, these resources, uh, baggage, has maybe become what you have begun to worship. Maybe you've put your faith in some of these things. Even if they're not bad things, once they become God level, it's a little dangerous. Maybe you've been relying on these things to save you, to set you free, to rescue you. And the invitation that God is giving you today is this. Lay it down. Lay it down. God, I've got nothing. I'm just setting aside for now. I've got nothing. And I come to you with open hands. I don't know how you're going to heal me. I don't know what you're going to do. Naaman had a lot of ideas about what might happen. And his expectations become a barrier for him later in the story. You don't know what God's going to do. He might say yes, he might say no, he might say not yet. He might make it easy, he might make it hard, he might make it quick, he might make it long. You don't know. But the invitation for you today is to come to him with nothing. To open up your hands. To come empty-handed as a person in need, seeking a handout. Because as Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Amen. Let's pray. And I invite you in your mind to just picture setting down your baggage, setting down your resources, all the things that give you strength, your achievements, your accomplishments, your education, your training. And just say, God, these are tools. Use them if you want to. But ultimately, I need you. I come before you 
with nothing. God, you are a good God. You are full of surprises. And Lord, sometimes we get mad when you don't give us what we want when we want it. We certainly have a different time frame than you do. We certainly have different ideas about how things work, but I pray, God, that you will give us the grace to let go. That you will supernaturally empower us to lay these things at your feet and to say, use them if you want, God, but I surrender my trust to you. My trust is not in these things. My trust is not in my resources. My trust is in you. Bring your kingdom. Bring your kingdom, Jesus, on earth as it is in heaven. Bring your kingdom through the least and the last and the lowest in society. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see. Give us the grace to be able to receive the words that you have for us through them. And Lord, I pray that out of your kindness, you will free us. That you will take us on a journey that will deepen us and stretch us exactly how we need to be deepened and stretched. We pray these things in your name because we know, Jesus, that you want to form us more than we even want to be formed. You want to free us even more than we want to be freed. You want to give us a future even more than we can even guess at. And you are building your kingdom. And may you build your kingdom here. May you build your kingdom through city life. May you build your kingdom and give us ears to hear and eyes to see. Thank you, God. Amen. God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy. God from whom all blessings flow.